<laughs> oh wait, that was a lot of me right there. <laughs> See, I think we need to be like, is it working? Okay, we need something. Wait, I have one of going on this side. Ah, yeah, just a minute. That's funny. This is for an iPad. Sorry, sorry, we're interrupting you here. Here, pull this out right here. Pull this out. Okay. There. Am I live? Can she see it? You guys, don't live live me at the same time. Do not yet. It'll, it'll go crazy. Okay, hi out there. We're doing a little talk. Okay, turn the damn thing off. Okay, turn it off. You're so weird. Oh. All right. Okay, so chapter, seriously, you guys are being weird. Chapter 17, speciation. Am I not being clear, Luke Bowman? Okay, it's not being funny. Speciation and macroevolution. So. Now we're taking it, we looked at microevolution in the last chapter, so now we're going into um, macroevolution. So this is any evolutionary change above the species level. So um, microevolution, you're still the same species, you're still interbreeding with each other, but with macroevolution, you're changing to another whole species. So on your notes, um, microevolution is a change in allele frequencies within a population. And macroevolution is the origin of new species, results from the accumulation of microevolutionary change over time. And slate, tell them number three. Okay, so. When you look at what is a species, right? So yeah, this is a cartoon, but it's to make a point. Um, how do you decide who is a species? And so there are right now 24 different ideas, ideas for species definition. And if you look at this, you could say, would these be the same species? Because they're red, they have the same number of teeth, do they have the same number of tentacles, are they in the same location, are their eyes the same? How do you decide, where do you draw the line that this is one species and this is another species? So we're going to look at a couple of different definitions of that. One is morphological species concept. That has to do with morphology, structures, and anatomy. Um, and so do you, do you look like you have the same parts? This is really helpful when you're looking at fossils, if you have an idea of their structure. But um, the, the issue is going to be is you don't know anything about their behavior. Just because they have the same morphology, their behavior could separate them. Um, their um, reproductive organs could separate them um, from being the same species that they couldn't interbreed. So that, that's just one. Um, another one is looking at its phylogeny. Who, who is related to who? Um, and looking at their lineage. And you can do that in, in addition to their morphology. So let's write those two down. Go to what is a species? Uh, morphological species concept. Species are distinguished from each other by distinct physical characteristic characteristics. Helpful for paleontologists, right? Because they're looking at fossils. Difficult because. Um, and why don't you ping pong back and forth on the difficult part? Go ahead. So bacteria and other microorganisms don't have a lot of measurable traits for you to compare. Um, another difficult part is cryptic species are almost identical but may vary in mating calls, like I said, about behavior and does not consider behavior. Okay. All right. Um, evolutionary species concept. Members of the species share a distinct evolutionary pathway in addition to morphological traits. So you're looking at speciation using the fossil record. All right. Um, and then 
then here, using the phylogenetic species concept, we're going to talk about cladograms, and that's going to come up in another chapter, and so this will just be a quick introduction to it. But when you look at a cladogram, then you're saying all of these different species share this common ancestor. And then you kind of get dropped off the club that these right here might have something that this guy doesn't have, so he gets left behind. And then you can work your way up getting more and more specific. The ends would represent some sort of species. Um, so um, on this one, you can kind of see each of the branching points right here. And I'm going to give you a sample of that. They have some ancestral trait, which would kind of anchor all of them, and then they're gonna branch off. Now, you could do this using morphologies, um, structures, and that's how I'm gonna introduce it to you because it's really simple and easy to see. But you could do this using um, sequencing in amino acids. You could do this using sequencing in DNA. Um, and so let's try a sample of this using morphologies. So all of these organisms, fish, salamander, lizard, mouse, ape, human, all have a backbone. So that could be their ancestral trait that they share. Which of these have lungs? Humans. Humans, okay. <laughs> Good call. <laughs> ape bio. Who else? <laughs> An ape. What else? Mouse. mouse. Lizard. Lizard. Salamander. salamander. Okay. All right, who has claws? A lizard has claws? Mouse has claws, okay. Yes, you do. What are they called? Nails. Okay. All right, keep going. Um, who has hair? Humans have hair? Some. Ape. Mouse. Okay, who has thumbs? Apes and humans. Apes and humans. Do you see a little pattern here? <laughs> okay, and who's bipedal, walking upright? Humans. Humans. So what you do, I set this up so it would be really easy, okay? So you could kind of see the sequencing that goes here. And basically when you set up a cladogram, your anchoring trait might be here that everybody has a backbone. And then we're going to start dropping different organisms off. So using that... Okay, we could start down here and we could say, okay, everybody has a backbone. That's where we're going to start. Okay, then what's our next trait that all of them have but one? Lungs. 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 Okay, so we could put from here on up, you have to have lungs. Who do we have to drop off? Fish. The fish. Okay, good. So we're making a cladogram right now. Okay, um, what's the next thing everybody has but one? Claws and, nails. Claws and nails. Okay, so we're gonna put that here. Who's gonna get dropped off? Salamander. Salamander. He he no longer he no longer gets to be in our club. We're dropping him. Okay, it's just more and more exclus exclusivity, right? All right. What's the next trait we're gonna look at? All but one probably have it. Hair. Okay, and who are we dropping off? Lizard. The lizard. Okay, so he doesn't get to play with the rest of us anymore. Um, what's next? Opposable. Opposable thumb, and who gets dropped off? A, a mouse. <laughs> okay, and what's your next one? Bipedal. Okay, so you just did a very, very simple cladogram, and from this, you're looking at derived characteristics as they come up. We're going to assume that hair is a newer trait than claws and nails because more of them had claws and nails than they had hair. Do you see what I'm saying? So this is a derived trait and you keep working up and you're saying since the fewest of, of these organisms, bipedal is the newest evolved trait because so few organisms have that, but they have all these other ones. Does that make sense to you? So that's a cladogram. We could do that same thing, like I said, with sequencing of DNA or sequencing of proteins and look to see at differences and variations and mutations. So that's going to be an upcoming chapter. Um, so let's let's actually let's go back into your notes on that one. Go to um, ma, 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 na, ma, na. phylogenetic species concept. Is that where I'm at? Mm -hmm. Smallest set of interbreeding organisms, usually a population that share a common ancestor. That share a common ancestor. If you're monophyletic, what does mono mean? 
One. one phylogeny. If you're monophyletic, it's a branch of the phylogenetic tree that contains all the descendants of a common ancestor. That's what we did right here on the most simplest of ways. Um, an advantage, it does not rely on morphological traits only, like this one did. You could also use DNA or protein. Okay, then the next thing in your notes is superstar. Do you see how it's superstar? Star, star, star. And what does that say? Biological species concept. Do you have that? It's not superstar. Oh, it's not star. Sorry, superstar. It's star in my notes. Biological species concept. Um, look to see, just reading the definition, what do you have to have for biological species? Go ahead. What are the key words there you think we need to identify? Maybe that'll help. Population. Population. Okay, keep going. They're interbreeding in nature. nature. Good. And what else? Viable, Viable fertile offspring. And they do not breed successfully with other populations. They do not breed successfully with other populations. Um, and so um, if... Um, you meet this as your criteria, then one of the big things that's involved here is interbreeding. So where could that, where could that then cause a problem? Are all organisms sexual? No. no. Some organisms are asexual, right? And so if you're asexual, how do you apply this definition? Okay, and what about fossils? When they're fossils, they're rocks. You're not going to have rock sacks. You don't know if they're going to interbreed because they're not alive, right? And so you don't know if they would interbreed. So that is also where you kind of comes into trouble. So there are problems with that. Now, um, I'll let you apply. Not it. Okay. Talk about evaluating the biological species concept. One's going first and third, and one's going second. Go ahead. I don't, hi, um, you know what, if, if I didn't reverse camera this, this would be forward facing for them, right? If I didn't flip the camera, it's good for you? Oh, so it's just weird on my phone. Yeah. Oh, yay, so it's forward facing for you. That's good to know. Okay. Right? So this is showing you where the problem is right here. It's easier with animals than it is with other organisms. All right. So on your biological species concept, it relies primarily on reproductive isolation to identify different species, lack of gene flow, lack of gene flow. Blue, can you please define reproduction reproductive isolation i'll define it for you okay physiological behavioral and genetic processes that inhibit interbreeding and we're going to go into that in just a little bit okay and disadvantages cannot always be tested in nature and cannot be applied to asexual organisms cannot be applied to asexual organisms Right, now, just so you can see, remember I told you there was a lot of definitions of what a species is. Here are just a few I'm going to show you. So here's the first one, biological species one, common. Okay, um, just kind of glance through some of these. Pick one to share with your bio buddy. Go ahead. I already said this one. Okay. Yeah. Okay, here are still more definitions. Pick one to share with your bio buddy. Okay, so this is just showing you there are several different ways out there to identify a species. We're going to focus on the biological species definition. Youngest bio buddy, review that one more time for them. Go ahead. DNA hybridization, what do you think that means? 
Okay, so if you could make DNA single-stranded, what would be a way to make DNA single-stranded? RNA polymerase doesn't make it single-stranded. Let's think of, we, have, oh, we haven't learned about PCR yet? No, we did. No, we did. So what did we use? Heat, right? Make it single-stranded, right? Okay. We did learn about that, peeps. Okay, if you made your DNA single-stranded, right, and then you mix the DNA and you look to see how much they can hybridize, how much they can line up with each other, you could show similarities that way as well, how well their DNA lines up. That's what that is coming from. All right, so now what we want to move into is what keeps them separate. So if you're going to have two different species, what keeps them two different species that they just don't go back and forth with gene flow, okay? So we're gonna talk about two big isolating mechanisms, one, or categories. One category is prezygotic. So that is anything that happens up to forming a zygote that can be an isolating me mechanism. And then postpsychotic is you've made a zygote, but they are, it is still an isolating leading mechanism and we'll ping pong back and um, forth through those so define any structural functional or behavioral characteristic that prevents successful reproduction from occurring but remember when we looked back at our original definition back here right um, interbreed in nature and produce what viable fertile offspring so you could produce for you could produce an offspring but if it's not viable or fertile if it can't reproduce then you have not um, uh, then those two species cannot interbreed. Did you, I think I gave you a pogo. Did I give you a pogo yet on that? Yeah. Okay, so good. That should be a review. All right. So we're going to first do the prezygotic isolating mechanisms. So it's <laughs> all the way up to when the sperm meets the egg. The first type is habitat isolation. We just don't live near each other in the same habitat, so we're not likely to interbreed. Two different habitats. So on your um, prezygotic isolating mechanisms, habitat isolation, even within the same geographic range. So it could be the forest canopy. I live at the top of the canopy. You live at the middle. Some other one lives at the bottom. So we're not in exactly the same um, place within our habitat. Um, then the next one is temporal isolation. Now let's assume that we live together in the same area, but when I like to have sex is not when you like to have sex. It's at two different times. These frogs, you can see that they're all living within that same area, but they have different times of the year when they would interbreed. And so they can live side by side, but that still maintains speciation. So temporal isolation, different times, or different locations within the habitat. Different times or different locations within the habitat, meaning I like to have sex at the top of the tree, you like to have sex at the bottom of the tree or the bottom side of the leaf, okay? The third one is it assumes you live in the same habitat, it assumes that you wanna have sex at that time, at the same time in the same place, but behaviors keep us from reproducing. So that's behavioral isolation. You don't know my dance. We, you don't know my signals to indicate that you're ready to reproduce. So you could have two crabs on the beach and one wants to mate and it's signaling by lifting a claw up and like going, hey, hey, you know, which means I'm ready to have sex with you. And the other claw is like, the other crab is like, I don't know what you're saying. And they keep pounding both claws onto the sand. And that's how they indicate that they're ready for sex. So once, <laughs> and they're not communicating with each other um, they because they don't know each other's signals. So that would be behavioral isolation. Okay, so behavioral isolation, pheromones, dances, or calls could isolate. Okay, so now let's assume you're in the same habitat, you want to have sex at the same time, and you even know each other's, you know, um, greeting call for sex, a dance or a smell, but in this place your parts don't fit together. So this is mechanical isolation. So for instance, a male dragonfly has claspers that only work on its same species of dragonfly in order to facilitate reproduction. So um, this would be mechanical isolation. Now I'm gonna give you an example on a test, something I have seen and I'm just telling you right now so you do not say this to me. It was literally on an AP exam that somebody wrote. I said, 
please identify three different prezygotic isolating mechanisms, describe them, and give an authentic example. That sounds like something I would ask, right? right? What they said, and I kid you not, flies and dogs don't have sex together because their parts don't fit. Really? Really? Okay. So do, yeah, flies and dogs. I mean, I was like, Okay, it's like I don't want to read any of your tests anymore because you wrote something so lame. So make sure you use, if I ask you this and somebody write down, because I know somebody's keeping track of all the potential essays I would possibly give, is that I would ask you to give, name it, describe it, give an authentic example of it. Okay? So on uh, mechanical isolation, inaccessibility, oh, another one to think besides the dragonfly is pollen, is that you're, the pollen can be released, but it doesn't have the ability to migrate down onto that flower or stick onto that flower, and so the pollen, the sperm, is not um, fertilizing the egg. Okay, so now, same habitat, right? Want to have sex at the same time. I know your dance. Our parts fit together, okay? But then there's what's called gametic isolation. So um, in this case, all the way up to where the sperm meets the egg, there's something there like you don't have a receptor for that. And so they do not fuse. And so that would be, but keep in mind, the farther you go along in here, the more wasteful it is. If this is at the point where it, it stops, then you have wasted all that time and energy copulating with one another with no good outcome from that. So the earlier you interfere with the mating process, the better, right? That's why you can see like really elaborate dances and things with birds is because if you don't know my dance, then I don't even want to start down that process because this is really wasteful when it gets to this point. So on your gametic isolation, gametes may not fuse to form zygote. Think surface receptors on eggs. All right, next, um, we have a monster quiz. And at home, you can play monster quiz with us as well, too. want to join us at home, you go to hellosmart.com and then you put in this number 878-464 on hellosmart.com. I'll make it bigger. Okay, maybe I won't make it bigger. Can you see that on the screen for those of you double viewing this presentation? <laughs> okay. What? Is it blurry? Oh, okay. So you go to hellosmart.com. She knows. Hellosmart.com. And then the code for this is 878464. And we're going in as our favorite dog. Okay, so let's see. We're going to get into teams here. I bet it's easier now to see how to get in this class. Is it, and it's forward facing for them. Is that accurate? Is it better? All right, so let's divide into teams. How about, how many do you want to be? How many teams? Five? There's 25 students. Okay. No, but they're other Okay. Um, let's see who who are my barrel busters. Raise your hand if you're a barrel buster. Look around the room. There are one, three, four, five barrel busters. I should see five hands up. Up, 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 up. Oh. Not O. Oh. I'm talking to you. Okay, where are snow blinders? Snow blinders, look around the room. Okay, lava slingers. Look around the room. And boom boxers, where are you, boom boxers? Raise your hand, boom boxers. And then he wavers. All right, here we go. Remember, if you miss it, you're going to be re given that question again.
think lava slingers are winning. Wrecking it. There we go. Okay, we at? Are we, oh, heat wavers. Let's go, heat wavers, lava slingers. Where are my snow blinders? Raise your hand, snow blinders. Well done, snow blinders. Well done. See if your bio buddy is a lava slinger and help them. See if your bio buddy is a lava slinger. Check right now. Do you need assistance, lava slinger? All right, morphological species concept has problems due to what? Does not consider what? Behavior. Remember, guys, morphology is you're just looking at structures. You don't know what they're going to do with those structures. So that's the downside of the morphological species concept. You don't know how you move about, how you interact with other organisms. Okay, what was surprising to me is if you look at this, look at how many of you, this is the first run at it, how many of the people put distinct physical characteristics? That is what you use to identify it, okay? Um, biological species concept, almost all of you got that. Relies on reproductive isolation, okay? Um, a few of you said fossils, okay? Fossils don't have sex. <laughs> Number three, pheromones, dances, or cells, that's I, um, or calls, sorry, behavioral isolation, most of you got this. Same range, different habitat, habitat isolation. That was pretty obvious. <coughs> Inaccessibility, even though within same range, and you have correct behavior. So this is saying your parts are fitting together. Okay. Um, six, we live in the same place, but like to reproduce at different times or in different places. Um, let me get that answer. There you go. So temporal isolation. What's the first isolation that we talked about? Habitat. Habitat. So that means we live in the same place, right? Uh, or we're, we're in the same area, but not some, the same aspect. We're not close to each other within that habitat. Then the second one was what? Temporal. So I'm living in the same place as you, but I don't like to have sex at the same time of the year or the same exact place in that habitat. What was the next one? Behavioral. Behavioral. Live in the same place, right? and um, reproduce at the same time, but I don't know your songs or your moves. What's the next one? Mechanical. Okay, our parts don't fit together. And then what was the next one? What? G gametic isolation, right. So our gametes don't fit together. All right, number seven, my surface receptors are not accepting your surface receptors. So that's gametic isolation. All right, so now let's transition to post-zygotic um, isolating mechanisms. Just keep in mind how wasteful this is, right? Because you've already wasted, maybe you only reproduce once a year and you just used it up on something that's not gonna go to fruition, that you could make an offspring potentially, but it's not gonna be viable. So that's why the pre-zygotic isolating mechanisms, if you have those in place, would be best. So you have a couple, three different options here. Um, either you reproduce and the hybrid doesn't develop normally, like it would cause a spontaneous abortion or miscarriage or it won't develop within the egg or whatever it is. Um, they do um, survive, um, but they're sterile. Or they do survive and the first generation is not sterile, but the second generation is. All of those options are very, very wasteful. 
Um, so here's an example of zygote mortality. Um, these are two cats, and they look very similar to each other, but the, the zygote does not completely develop. Um, in this case, um, you probably know what mules are. So that's when a horse and a donkey have sex. And it depends on which one is the female um, can have an influence on that. The hybrid are usually, this is called the F1, are usually sterile, but not always. It could be the F2s that are sterile, or it could be that in um, the, if two mules mate, their offspring will definitely be sterile if two mules make. So horse and donkey makes a mule, another horse and donkey makes a mule. Those two mules are viable in that they can reproduce, but if two mules have sex with each other, their F2 is not viable. Okay. All right, so on post-zygotic isolating mechanisms, after the formation of zygote, you have hybrid inviability. A zygote cannot develop properly. Zygote cannot develop properly. Or hybrid sterility, think mules. Sometimes they can mate, but the F2 hybrids have a reduced fitness. Have a reduced fitness. All right, so we're going to run through all the different, um, just a different way of saying it, just but it's all the isolating mechanisms. You're going to ping pong back and forth. Not it. Pass or play on going first. Try to look at it and I yell it the best you can. Okay? Go ahead. This is just habitat separated out. Okay, go ahead. This is all. I think the both of them are Well, this one. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, no. Ecological would be habitat because they, one lives on the tree and one lives on the ground. But then the last one. But didn't she say one likes to have Oh, no, that's, yeah. Okay, did you go through those three? Okay. Go ahead, keep going. And then behavioral isolation, so one bird sings a different song and the other one is a different song. What do you mean? Oh, yeah. This looks like a viable option, yeah. right? For when you're absent, it is a viable option, possibly. What? Yeah, if you, yeah, if you meant, yeah. Well, you can watch it. Yeah, you can watch it. Yeah, it's Yeah, my issue would be like when I put um, a reviews up on YouTube from when we do seventh period, like it takes a while to load it. Is it low? I don't know how it's loading it right now on my YouTube channel. I don't I, yeah, but I'm wondering yeah, how long yeah. it'll take them to do it. Uh, oh, okay. Well, you, you'll help me. Okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you'll help me. All right. All right. Are you good with all those examples? Are you feeling confident? Easy peasy, right? All right. So speciation is the splitting of one species into two or more species or the transformation of one species into a new species over time. And so on your notes, modes of speciation. Do you see how I put that up at the top for you already? Okay, so what we want to talk about now is how could this possibly come about, right? So we've talked about um, isolating mechanisms, but how does it even start? So the most common form of speciation is allopatric speciation, that you have a single species, but some sort of geographical barrier um, separates them, and it divides them, and <coughs> over time, remember, they're going to to have their both um, initial gene frequencies will be different. Think founders effect, right? 
okay? So you're splitting. So each one of these initial, each one of these will have their initial gene frequencies will be different. They will undergo different mutational pressures. They will go undergo different selection pressures. So for instance, on this side, it might have more trees and on the right side, it has fewer trees. So what it takes to survive and reproduce would be, would the adaptations would be different. Um, so I would like, please, the dark-shirted bio buddy, explain allopatric speciation and what's happening here. Go ahead. Um, well, if it's it's a 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 it's Okay. And let me give you an authentic example of this type of speciation. It has to do with salamanders migrating south um, through the state of California. So you had initial species, and then you have this big desert in the middle of California that um, the salamanders couldn't live in. So some went left and some went right. And as they migrated down, remember, initial gene frequencies were different, different selection pressures, different mutations occur. So even though the barrier is removed, they no longer interbreed because those reproductive isolating mechanisms have taken over that we talked about just a little bit before. This is what's referred to as a ring species because you can specifically see they were together and then like a ring, they went differently. Then they were rejoined, but you had different species. Okay, um, other bio buddy, whoever just went light shirted, go ahead, talk about this ring species right here. Go ahead. <laughs> All right, now, um, I, I want uh, Slate to take what's going on here on, describe what's happening here on the left. Blue, you explain what's happening here on the right. Go ahead. Did, did speciation occur here on the left? No, a geographic barrier separated them, but then when they got back together, they started interbreeding again. So this did not lead to speciation, but did it lead to speciation on the right? Yes. Okay, let's look at some examples of this with Darwin's finches. Um, ping pong each row back and forth. Each of you kind of explain what's occurring, and we'll have the youngest bio buddy start up top. Go ahead. <laughs> So up here at the top, right here and here, this is the same species up here on the top, right? But there's some geographical barrier like a body of water. So they, one flew off a group, it could be founder's effect, right? Different initial gene frequency when they moved over there. And then over time, because of their environment was drier than the original island, then what was a, considered an adaptation was different. And so you start having a lot, vast amounts of time and what's adaptive, what survives, what reproduces the thumb, right? Natural selection. And then if for some reason they go back to this original island, then you can see that they have, there are two different species, one now living in the drier area and the original one still living where they had more water. And that is exactly what has happened um, with Darwin's finches. And where you have more competition, you're going to get more of that splitting into different lineages where you're favoring one extreme over another. All right, so on your notes, go to allopatric speciation, species separated by a geographical barrier who then undergo different selection pressures. 
And then I gave you some examples there about salamander species in California. Put a little dash after that and put ring species because that's an example of um, a ring species. Iguanas, salmon in Washington State. All right, now, reinforcement, okay? So take a look up here. Um, you do not have a dewlap, a little flap, um, but dewlaps are used to signal um, other, um, other uh, like a mating. And if you, if you look in here, in darker environments, the dewlap is more effective if it's light, so it looks different and you can flash it around. Um, in brighter environments, it's better if your dewlap is darker. And then this kind of reinforces this difference between them. Um, and keeps that as an isolating mechanism. It's a morphological change, right, in their structure that kind of reinforces that um, process. Now, um, and that was the last thing on your notes right there, reinforcement of reproductive isolation, the process of natural selection that reinforces reproductive isolation, and I said think differences in color. Okay, now, less common um, then allopatric um, speciation is sympatric speciation. And I was thinking you were side by side and you changed right before me. In sympatric speciation, this is on Lord Howe Island in Australia. And there's um, a group of trees. And then like right in the middle of that group of trees, there's a huge, there's a difference. There's a speciation that took place. Now that kind of speciation where you were side by side is going to be a chromosomal change that would do that. Um, and so let's look at a couple of different examples here. Um, there's autopolyploidy and allopolyploidy. Autopolyploidy, and I'll give you um, a good example of that here in just a minute. This is within that species that meiosis failed. And remember in meiosis, we go from being diploid to what? Haploid. So let's say meiosis failed and you get two gametes coming together that are still diploid but the gametes were improperly made. And so in that case, in autopolyploids, you're derived within a single species. In allopolyploidy, you have two different species who are mating. Let's say the haploid number of one is five and the haploid number of another one is seven, right? So remember, what does fertilization do? It restores the homologous pairs, right? So they're not gonna line up properly because they won't match. But if a mitotic event occurs, you can make them diploid now with their five and seven chromosomes, they would have a doubling. So you'd have 10 and then double of seven would be what? 14. So what's 10 and 14? 24, okay? And then you can restore it. So that's between two different species. So take it the first one, why doesn't the oldest bio buddy explain autopolyploidy? Okay, that's within one species and a doubling. Go ahead, I'll let you explain it. Now, I'm going to tell you this any kind of change in chromosome number for animals generally does not work right? Down syndrome is trisomy 21. That's just one extra chromosome, okay? We animals don't work that well that way, with, but plants, it's more common. Um, so what would this be if we did this in humans? What would this be? Okay, so what is our 2N number? No, our 2N number. How many chromosomes do you have? 46, right? When you make, hello, where are you? When you make gametes, how many chromosomes are in your gametes normally? 23. So let's talk autopolyploid with us. So that would be like an egg that had how many chromosomes in it? Not 23, that's normal. 46 and a sperm with 46, okay? Sperm and egg now getting together, now how many do you have? 92, okay? Will that work for us? No, it will not. That's why I'm telling you, plants, it's more likely to work. Sometimes their fruit is bigger as a result of that. And the plant could even be hardier as a result of that or produce more flowers as a result. But for us, it does not work. That would be autopolyploidy for us. 
Um, so as a result of that, you're a tetraploid. If you can survive, re keep in mind, you can't go back and mate with the original because you won't have homologous pairs. You'll be off right, right, by twice as much. But if you have enough that you can interbreed with each other, you could start a new species that way. Okay, now let's contrast that to allopolyploidy. In allopolyploidy, other bio buddy, you explain that first before I do. Go ahead. Okay, so let me let me jump in there. In allopolyploidy, two different species doing meiosis correctly, making their haploid gametes, right? But in this case, this wild wheat species, it's 2N number is 28, so its gametes are only going to have how many? 14. This wild wheat species, its 2N two number, two number is 14, so its gamete only has 7. Okay, so these are not, when this sperm or when this pollen and this egg get together, they're not going to reunite homologous pairs because they don't have homologous pairs because they're two different species. But if when they get together, 14 and 7, right, is how many? 21. If that doubles, okay, so if they undergo a mitotic event within that cell and do not do cytokinesis, then all of a sudden now you have 42, right? You doubled up. Then you have your homologous pair, okay? This would be us. Oh, I don't even want to go there with people. But if you had, I, let's think of something else. But if you had an organism whose diploid number was 40, what would be its haploid number? 20. And another one whose diploid number was 30, what would be its haploid number? 15. So you have the 20 and 15 get together, but they're not homologous, right? So then they do mitosis and they double up, okay? And today's wheat bread is that, okay? And you can see that in plants, but again, it doesn't work so well in um, animals. So sympatric speciation, Defined as speciation without a geographic barrier, usually involves divergence in diet or microhabitat. Diet or microhabitat. Um, I said think cichlid fish, um, edge in open water of a lake or chromosomes. I'll talk about the fish later, or chromosomes. Polyploidy is more than 2N and it is more likely in plants. In autopolyploidy, 2N plant produces 2N gametes due to non-disjunction. Due to non-disjunction. Okay, allopolyploidy is two different but related species hybridized. All right, and that is, we'll start there next time. Um, so hope that was helpful and you're feeling better at home. I'm not 100% sure how to stop it. Do you know how to stop it? Do I just hit the X? Are you sure you want to stop sharing? Yes, I am sure. Yeah.